Thank you, everyone. As you will know from the uh, program, it's a jam-packed session today, so we need to get this ball rolling. Well, good morning, everyone. Before we begin today, I think we should all take a moment to acknowledge that we're meeting on the unceded lands of the Baramadigal people of the Darug Nation. It has always been and will always be Aboriginal land. And it's with respect that I acknowledge all the past and present and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today, both online, we have an online component, and in the room. I don't know if Kaya Boaji is here, but I know she will be attending, so I just want to acknowledge her attendance today. It is here on Baramadigal land that we are privileged to be able to continue the practice of knowledge generating and sharing that has taken place on this country for tens of thousands of years. I wish to remind us all here that we cannot disentangle the conversations that we have today from the long history of these lands and the everyday realities of colonial dispossession and white hegemony, what we now call Australia. I want to welcome all of you here to From Recommendations to Action, Local Responses to the UNWGEPAD Preliminary Report. Wow, I practice that a lot. <laughs> My name is Kathleen Openshaw and I'm a lecturer in the School of Social Sciences. I'm also the convener for today's event and the one that's found in your inbox. This event is a result of a partnership between Western Sydney University Social Justice Network and the African Australian Advocacy Centre. It is not the first time that Western Sydney University and the AAAC have worked together. Among other projects, the School of Social Sciences and the AAAC facilitated the Sydney consultation process when the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, WGEPAD, visited Australia in December last year. In fact, some of you who were there may have a little bit of deja vu because it was in this very room that we had that consultation process. That visit was the beginning of how we came to today. And it is also the beginning of a lot of work that we need to do. In December, 2022, this working group visited Canberra, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney. It was the first time that the working group had visited Australia. And for context, this group was established in 2002 by the Commission on Human Rights after the need for such mechanism was identified at the World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia and Related Intolerance. And that was held in Durban, in my home country of South Africa, in 2001. During the working group's visit to Australia, its representatives spoke to a number of instruments of government, human rights and community organisations, as well as heard the personal experiences of individuals living in Australia. They also received formal written submissions from the same. At the end of their trip, the working group released a preliminary report of their findings and recommendations. The report does make for some difficult reading. It highlights the pervasiveness of racism experienced by people of African descent living in Australia and raises some quite troubling concerns about human rights transgressions. The final report will be presented to the United Nations Human Rights Council in September, and um, some of the meeting some of the learnings from this meeting today will be a company will a comp will go with the AAAC delegates, um, and they'll be sharing a lot of what we're discussing today. So this is going somewhere, right? I think that's really important. So in my conversations with Noelle Zinhabangwe, chairperson of the AAAC, who many of you know and who many of you will meet, we discussed, well, quite simply, where to begin. What we know is that we need to capitalize on the way to the working party's first ever visit to Australia in challenging those in positions of power to prioritize the group's findings and recommendations. Alongside steering harmful, homogenizing and deficit narratives around African settlement towards more nuanced and strength based discussions. Throughout my reading of the report's recommendations, I found myself questioning well, what would these look like at local level? Moreover, communities have the solutions to, cons to concerns that are affecting them. 
but often they are not considered experts in their own lives, and their voices are muted, ill-considered, or spoken over. And so concentrating on the local seemed like a pretty good place to start when we were thinking about how we're going to transform these working groups' recommendations into action. Today is the first step towards this. Drawing on the themes of the UN International Decade of the People of African Descent, and that runs between 2015 and 2024, that is recognition, justice, and development. Our speakers, our incredible speakers, will explore how we might operationalize the high level recommendations made by the UN Working Group at local level. Our aim is to consider co created solutions to the complexity of issues faced by people of African descent living in Great Western Sydney, especially given how diverse this cohort is across demographic indicators. Our event brings together experts and stakeholders from across an array of sectors who are working with and in the service of African communities in Greater Western Sydney and beyond. Among those in attendance, we have academics, students, human rights lawyers, community leaders, representations from local government and settlement focused organizations. We are also very honored to have the Lord Mayor of Parramatta, Samir Pandey, join us this morning, an indication of his support of the African communities who are contributing to the vibrant and growing city of Parramatta. What fortune that in one room we have such a diversity of perspectives that are all working towards a shared goal of actively addressing issues of social justice affecting African diasporic communities in Australia. Alongside the beginnings of a roadmap of sorts for this work that can be done in Australia at local level, and of course suggestions on how we can agitate for this to be a priority at state and national level, we hope that today supports a strengthening of existing and also the building of new partnerships among those invested in making Australia a more welcoming place for people of African descent. Because it is not only good for people of African descent, but it is Australia that benefits as well. So I know this is not the Oscars, but an event like this is a, re is a result of a great investment of resources. So please allow me just a few minutes to acknowledge the labors and support of those involved. Firstly, I extend my gratitude to Professor Alfia Passamayaseri, who is PBC of Engagement and Advancement at Western Sydney University and the inaugural chair of the Social Justice Network. When I met with her at the beginning of the year to chat about the working group's visit and the pretty damning preliminary report, she was quick to offer resources under the umbrella of the Social Justice Network so that we could, break, we could begin the hard graft of addressing the report's recommendations. Her support speaks to Western Sydney University's investment and connection to the local communities we serve. Thank you to her team, Tori and Katie. Tori and Katie are the event management extraordinaires. There is nothing that is too much for them. So they really did help us so much in putting this all together. Yay! <laughs> I want to thank AAAC for partnering with us. I know it can be scary partnering with universities, right? <laughs> and for all of their labors in getting this event off the ground. It is a privilege to do this work with them. What many of you don't know, because everything seems really kind of shiny and, and seamless, <laughs> is that the members of the AAAC do this advocacy work in addition to their demanding working, domestic and social responsibilities. I want to extend my thanks to presenters today, all of whom have been so incredibly generous in giving up their time and their expertise. It is your considered thoughts and perspectives that will drive our discussions of today and our actions of tomorrow. And lastly, to all of you here in person, online, I don't want to forget about the online component, who have, who have prioritized showing up today and who will contribute to these discussions and we're so grateful that you are here. The conversations that we have today will be full and productive. Allow me just a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to our Lord Mayor. There are restrooms on this level, important stuff. So it's on the right hand side, 
the female restrooms are just as you walk out of the room. The male restrooms are just a little bit down and to the right. In the case of an emergency, there are emergency stairs also, again, just to the right as you exit out of this room. Also, I just want to flag again, and I know it was in the, um, the information that I sent out to everyone spamming your inboxes. Sessions of this event will be recorded by an on-site videographer. Or on-site, hello, um, And the full event will be streamed and recorded via Zoom. This will be hosted on the African Australian Advocacy Centre and the Social Justice Network social media platforms. And these recordings will mainly feature the panel members and the speakers, but your images might be captured in the background. We will also be taking notes. It's really important that we document today. And so we also want to make sure that we're acknowledging everybody's ideas and thoughts. So if you wish to ask a question or, um, or a comment, or you want to engage in any way, please, if you don't mind, if you state your name and your affiliations, just so we can make sure that we're recording everything. Okay, enough from me. You didn't come here to hear from me. It is an absolute pleasure to invite the Lord Mayor of the City of Parramatta, Samir Pandey, who has so generously joined us to say a few words this morning. So please do welcome him. Warami is good to see you all in our local Darug language. So good to see you all. I acknowledge these lands as the traditional meeting place where Barramundu people of the Darug clan have gathered for more than 50,000 years. And I acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I also acknowledge uh, member for Liverpool, Karishma Kalyana. Good to see you in Parramatta. And I acknowledge um, WSU Social Justice Net Network. And while I was entering the lift, uh, we were reminded that we are in the number one university in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's so great to have WSU in Western Sydney and Parramatta. Uh, and very timely reminder when you walk into the lifts uh, that we are in one of the best universities in the world. And I also acknowledge Noel from founder of um, African Australian Advocacy Centre. Noel, thank you. Um, friends and community members, and can I also acknowledge uh, our good friend Rosemary, who was the Australian local hero in 2021. Uh, good to see you here as well. And everyone else here. <laughs> and I also um, acknowledge everyone who is online as well. Uh, good to see you all. It's great to have be here. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that you you are we all are here um, on this very important topic, very important uh, for a number of members in our community. I'm very pleased to welcome you here today to this event from recommendations to action, local responses to the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent Preliminary Report. This report is significant for all of us who seek to promote harmony and unity in our communities. The working group visited Australia in December 2022 and found that there is work to be done in health, education, employment, integration, discrimination, detention, and policing of African Australians. The UN General Assembly has declared the decade to 2024 as the International Decade for People of African Descent, with the key themes recognition, justice, and development. I know you are someone with strong sense of justice and empathy, and this is your strength. Some in the community might not be aware of your stories, your incredible resilience, your struggles, your successes, and the enormous contribution that you make in the community. I encourage you all to share your journey, your stories. It's easy to talk about these things at a high level, but at City of Parramatta, we are committed to making this place one where everyone is welcome, no matter who they are and where they come from. City of Parramatta is one of the most diverse local government areas in Australia. 
We are proud to be the home of an important African diaspora community. We value the rich variety of contributions this significant diaspora makes to our society, culture, and economy. Panama is the center of Greater Sydney. We are vibrant, connected, and globally competitive. We are an education capital with more universities in our CBD than almost anywhere in Australia. More than 25,000 university students and double the New South Wales average of people with tertiary qualifications. Our educational and training sector is valued at 1.2 billion, employing nearly 12,000 workers and having grown by 70% over the past 10 years. By 2036, the majority of Greater Sydney residents are projected to live west of Panama with an estimated 130,000 new jobs in our region. Panama's gross regional product, GRP, reached 28.5 billion in 2022, with Panama's local economic growth outpacing statewide growth in the 15 years to 2022. There are many opportunities to join our skilled, fast-growing and culturally diverse academia and workforce. Everyone here today is living proof of this ongoing transformation. As you work together to translate the macro recommendations of this report into local level action plans and draw upon collective knowledge, wisdom and lived experiences, you are telling the story of Parameda's bright future. With all this growth and opportunity, it's important that we don't leave anyone behind. And that's something which is very close to my heart too in the city of Panama to ensure that we take everyone along in this journey, in this transformation, mm -hmm. and we do not leave anyone behind. We have a community strategy plan, CSP, which is a 20-year plan from 2018 till 2038 that outlines our community goals, fair, accessible, welcoming, green, thriving, and innovative. We recognize that Panama has always been a gathering place and our diversity is our strength. This, where we are today, our vision was for this to be a gathering place. Panama Square, we have five where we have our libraries and that's a gathering place. We wanted to say that it's a place dedicated to the community where everyone is welcome, where everyone can come and have a good time. City of Panama, that's our aim. To make it an inclusive and accessible place, a welcoming place, where there is something for everyone. 78 percent of the residents see Panama as culturally diverse, up from 15 percent from last year. 56 percent of non-residents also see Panama as culturally diverse. Without a doubt, the future of Greater Sydney is in Panama. There is so much happening here already, and I'm proud to see this growth flourish and continue to happen. We want communities not just to survive, but thrive in the city of Panama. We want everyone who lives in Panama, who works here, who invests here, who comes and plays or comes here for education, to have a positive, welcoming experience when they are in Panama. I urge everyone to practice, preserve, and promote the multi faith and multiculturalism fabric that we are so proud of. And I'll end by saying, a quote from Kofi Annan, who said, we may, we may have different religions, different languages, different colored skin, but we all belong to one human race. I extend my gratitude to all those who have gathered here today and who have worked on this report, very important report. And I look forward to being part of your journey in making Parramatta a more inclusive, accessible, and welcoming place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm so very grateful to you taking your time out of your incredibly busy day to be with us. Next up.
we have uh, Professor Alfia Pasmaense, who, as I mentioned before, is Pro Vice Chancellor of Engagement and Advancement at uh, Western Sydney University. And also, she's an incredible supporter of issues of social justice and is the inaugural chair of the Social Justice Network. And um, I would like her to come up and officially open our event today. Thank you. Mary <coughs> Gamara. Hello and welcome in the language of the Dara, the lands on which I live and work, and where we are meeting today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am lucky enough to live and work and have the opportunity to be able to give back to the lands and to the many communities of it. We are gathered here on the lands of the Baromatical people of the Darug Nation. And I would like to pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to any Indigenous peoples that are present here today. My name is Althea Pasamaya Nesli. It's a hard one. I like to uh, <laughs> keep up with it. And I am the Pro Vice Chancellor of Engagement and Advancement, and also a Professor of Sociology here at Western Sydney University. Within my role, I do think I have the best job at Western. Uh, I am responsible for leading the strategic engagement work to shape Western Sydney University's commitment to co-producing solutions to the interconnected challenges that face society. I am pleased to welcome all of you here today at Western's Parramatta City campus, those that are here in person and those that are joining us online by Zoom. I think it's really apt that we're meeting here in our Parramatta City campus, a building that is named after Peter Shergold who has dedicated his career to the work of social justice and to migrants and refugees. He is somebody who has strongly advocated for the rights of the migrant populations to advocate that if we invest in our migration, uh, our, our population that is based off of our migrants and our refugee and humanitarian status, communities, we are indeed investing <laughs> in Australia. If I think about this university, I recognize how much social justice is interwoven throughout its fabric. Just down the road from our Parramatta City campus is our Parramatta South campus, where we have there our Whitlam Institute. And if we think about the work of Gough Whitlam, a man who led his government to ratify 15 international human rights treaties in the space of three years, most notably the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which became the basis for the landmark Racial Discrimination Act of 1975. I am proud that we house the Whitlam Institute. I am proud that Peter Shergold was our chancellor for 10 years and has shaped the fabric of this university one that is a very value-based institution. I'm so pleased to see the diverse stakeholders that are present here. We have our uh, local and state government. Thank you so much to the Lord Mayor for, for being here and highlighting that we are the number one university. And I would have to say, it's the most proud ranking that I can point to for our university because it's number one in the way that we address the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. To me, that's the most important ranking that you can have that feeds into and is a reflection of our teaching, our research, our community engagement, the way that we are with our communities. <clears throat> so this gathering to me reflects how Western Sydney University defines itself as a university, how we see our function as a university. Right now, we are about midway through our strategy that's called sustaining success, which speaks to that we are a value and principle led university. That strategic, um, that strategy came from extensive consultation with people at Western, our staff, our students, our communities. So the values that are presented within it, boldness, fairness, integrity, and excellence, are realized through these principles that we have of sustainability, equity, transformation, and connectedness. And it's gatherings like this, to me, that represent that we are living to those values. 
following those principles. This is a lived strategy. It's not one that's going to sit on the shelf. And we make sure, the people of Western, that we live up to that strategy. So that work that we're doing here today is very much a reflection of the dedication of the dedication of our dedication to these values and principles. Western is definitely a university of and for the region. We recognize that our growth and transformation correspond to that of the communities we serve. Our decision to emphasize service to community as a strategic priority is bound within our mission statement. I know not everybody loves to read strategies, but it's a very beautifully succinct mission statement, which is starting in Western Sydney, our students will succeed, our research will have impact, and our communities will thrive. I think that's beautiful in the way that we recognize that our success is interwoven with that of our communities. This region, where we are proudly located, is home to the greatest number, number of people of African descent in New South Wales. The Social Justice Network has joined with the African Australian Advocacy Centre to pr provide a space for us to critically engage with the preliminary report tabled by the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, descent after their visit to Australia in 2022. Kathleen has pointed to what is in this uh, interim report. It details the multifaceted forms of racial discrimination, xenophobia, and systemic racism in Australia faced by Africans and people of African descent. The serious concerns raised in the report of racial profiling, racial slurs, abuse of authority, over policing, and under -protect protection are pardon me, are contrary to how Australia presents itself as a multicultural country that has an inclusive identity. It is contrary to the central tenets of the Declaration of Human Rights and indeed the Australian Human Rights Commission Act. We have come together to co-create solutions to the interconnected challenges detailed in this report. We are at a space and time where we are engaging with multiple forces of social, technological, economic, and global political change. It is in this space that the most positive answer to structural change lies in engagement, dialogue, and the recognition that greater justice, more respect, and broader freedoms benefit everyone. Human dignity and equality is key to generating transformation in the social, economic, and cultural spheres of society. They generate more respectful and peaceful relationships within societies and between them. Human rights are not political. They do not represent the left or the right. They enlarge freedom for all. By building actions out of the recommendations of this report, we are collectively <clears throat> building resilience and social harmony in our communities. Today, we seek to address the breach of human rights as detailed in this report. And my iPad just decided to throw a little tantrum on me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I will get there in just a moment, just as I was building up to the end. <laughs> um, here we are. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, there we go. Today we seek to address the breach of human rights as detailed in this report. And I've already spoken to this. We do so during a time when there is a revival of outspoken racism, discrimination, and xenophobia occurring around the world. Social media provides platforms for these divisive views that have crept into the public narrative with disturbing consequences that I believe we are all too familiar with. We have enough evidence that relates to matters concerning people of African descent in Australia. This event facilitates a space for us to create, if not a roadmap, then a blueprint for change. With you, we are co-creating communities that are more equitable and sustainable. Western is committed to this powerhouse of a region, one that cannot be easily captured in a few words. How do you capture a space of such diversity and potential? We are here today to build hope, 
and to create a path to solutions with justice and respect. Thank you, and I look forward to being part of the discussions today. Thank you so very much, Althea. Now, we have a fantastic um, presenter, although she's not here herself, Dr. Barbara Reynolds, who is actually the chair of the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. They sent a video um, that we're going to be playing now. So um, for those of you who are on the WhatsApp group online, if you have any problems, we have multiple like platforms here. Um, just let us know, but we're going to hit play now. Um, and I think what's really important is um, the support that Barbara is giving us here in Australia, um, particularly since this is this is our first rodeo. Um, and so she has she has provided so much support for us in terms of how we're going to negotiate our path going forward. Hello, AAAC colleagues and friends and attendees at this very important meeting. I just wanted to salute all of you on the work that you continue to do to advocate for the human rights of people of African descent in Australia, recognizing that when we advocate for the human rights of one group, we actually promote the human rights of all people all the time, because human rights are indivisible, they're interdependent, and we cannot separate one from the other. So your work is not just for people of African descent, but it's for all of Australians and also it's for all of us across the globe. So congratulations and salutations on that. Thank you for inviting me to join you. It's a privilege. I don't count it lightly. I do recognize that this work, this journey on which you are is of immense importance to you. And so, as a fellow traveler, I, I wanted to share with you my insights as you've asked me to do. When Australia came up on the list for us to do a country visit, my first response was why? Was it worth it? Um, there are other places where we have millions of people of African descent who are going through some really, really difficult times. So I was one of the resistors, but my colleagues prevailed and I'm so grateful to them for doing that because when we got to Australia our eyes were opened about so many things and it was a good reminder to me as a human rights advocate and a human rights educator that if the human rights of just one person are violated then we're all um, in jeopardy and so it was good to come to Australia what struck me most during the visit were three things. One, that there was a really immense pressure on African Australians to do one of two things, either to fit in completely or to maintain their Africanness completely. And this is not new, but I think because I've seen in other spaces how this is approached. For example, there's a lot of literature among uh, people of Hispanic um, origin in the US about this inner conflict. And it's usually an intergenerational conflict. And we saw a little bit of that. But I think in Australia, what struck me most was that it took on a really particular um, distinctiveness because the biggest challenge for me that I observed was this question of what is the African Australian identity? Who is the person of African descent in Australia? What does it mean to be a black Australian? And this question of identity is very important. It's fundamental to who we are. Identity formation comes from social spaces, the home, usually the school or the workplace, the places where we worship and in the public spaces, the marketplace, the train station. And I found that there was a lot of angst tied up in this. And so that was the first thing that struck me. 
The second thing that really, really struck me that was really, really troubling was just the disproportionate number of men of African descent in, um, in incarceration, basically, without a trial based on things around a character test in Australia. It was just not that the procedure seemed not to be in harmony with international human rights principles, but just the immense, the sheer immense numbers and the duration for how long these men were there and the kind of desperation in some people, the despair and the resignation that we saw on the faces of people and they expressed to us because part of this was that there was no end in sight. So that was the second thing that struck me. The third thing that struck me is that there was a kind of intellectual disconnect between what we were hearing from people in Australia, partners um, in government, partners in civil society, and what the outside world thinks Australia to be as part of this international community that continues to promote human rights, the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera, around the world. So those are my three impressions. Um, and I think if you examine them, you'll see that they're foundational to the work that you have to do. You have to address what's happening in the justice system. You have to address the interaction between law enforcement and people of African descent in their communities. And very, very importantly for us as human beings to not just to survive, but to thrive, to make our contribution to the societies that we call home our identity is important. So just three things to, to note. So where do you go from here? Um, the report is nearly ready. You'll get a copy of it soon. You had a copy of the preliminary conclusions, observations, and recommendations. They largely remain the same. And that is really our contribution to you. We're passing the baton back to you. When we arrived in Australia, you passed the baton to us, okay? metaphorically speaking, because our visit was not the first thing we were doing. So we borrowed some of your time. We were just a tiny, tiny, tiny contribution to what you've been doing. And we came in with objective eyes. We didn't have an ax to grind. We came in with an open ear and open eyes to look, to observe, to listen to try to understand, to engage, engage with government, engage with civil society, engage with passers-by in the street, and that's what we live. And so in sharing our observations, we pass the baton back to you with concrete things that we think, if those are implemented, they would go a long way to addressing the challenges that people of African descent face in Australia. So you asked, how should you operationalize this? I'm gonna, um, <laughs> I'm gonna channel <laughs> a children's program, and today is the letter A. So we begin by what do you do? There are two twin pillars <laughs> of what you need to do, absolutely, and one of them is to advocate. And I use advocate in both senses of the word to go out and promote and share, but also to represent people, whether it's in a court of law or in a tribunal, you have to advocate for the rights of your people. So advocate is one of those. And the other thing that has to be done is educate. And that means quite frankly, educating every Australian about why people of African descent are in Australia and what are they doing there? And how did they get there? And do they have a right to be there? And as they're there, how shall we engage with African Australians? <laughs> That's not an easy task. But those two things, I think, are fundamental. And then, of course, many of you are activists. And that activism must go along with the education and the advocacy um, that we always promote. I want to hazard a guess that this is the journey of a lifetime for many of us. It's something that we do, we contribute, but we have to ensure that those who come after us, the younger ones, 
understand and that we bring all people, all peoples, all groups into the tent. So as African Australians, as people of African descent in Australia, all religions, both genders, people of all persuasion, whether it's political, sexual orientation, people whose views on climate change may differ, people whose views on how to um, celebrate our Africanness. Everyone has a role to play. Everyone is involved. Everyone has a right to contribute. And hopefully we shall all benefit. So in doing so, then the second um, use of the word, the letter A has to be building alliances and making sure they're allies. Allies in the government, alliances in the private sector, allies in law enforcement, alliances with people who hold our very destiny in their hands. And if they treat it with indifference or if they treat it with disdain, they actually damage our lives. Now, from a human rights law perspective, the obligation to protect, promote, and provide for the rights of peoples rests with the state. And the state has as their caretaker the government. And so I think your advocacy and your education must begin with your government. Your government at the level of the Commonwealth, but also your government at the level of the state and any other local governments, because these are the people who are responsible for governance, for participation, public participation. These are the people who make the laws. These are the people who adjudicate the laws. And these are the people who implement what your legislatures say. And so your government has to obviously be a very, very key audience for you to engage. But there are others. There are others who will work with you and share with you. And these are the athletes and the artists who have so much influence on how our thinking is shaped, particularly younger people. Um, they look up to athletes and artists, artists in music, artists in the visual arts, artists in fashion, artists in food or culture. They have a lot of influence. We see them on YouTube, the influencers. You must engage these persons but also the academics, because it's the academics who will provide the data that are so persuasive, the numbers. You know, if you go to a government official and you say, a lot of people are suffering, so what? What's a lot? Who? What percentage? But if you're able to say specific numbers, specific time periods, the extent of what is happening, then those data speak for themselves and you now move to a different level of saying okay these are the data they're objective they're accurate they're reliable what will you do about it so the academics have a role to play the academics also have another role to play and they're the primary movers in the education system or history the curriculum extracurricular activities what kind of representation representation of africanness is in the textbook. What kinds of adjectives are used? How do people refer to Black people in textbooks, in discourse? The academics, along with the, the, act, sorry, the artists and the athletes, have an immense role in shaping that discourse, the discussions, the debates. And so some of you are academics your work must be dedicated to research and monitoring and evaluation and you must become a repository of all the knowledge about ourselves and how we solve our problems and how we share information is so important let me just give you two things in the very near future all of us will be challenged to become digital citizens we know that people of African descent are falling behind. And this is one area within which we can do so much among ourselves. We can bring our kids together 
on the weekend and teach them their history because if we don't, nobody else will. We can bring our kids together, our young people in safe spaces while they have fun and inculcate into them the values and the traditions of our forebears. In our public spaces that we share, in the church and the mosque and the temple, in the clubs, that's where this teaching, this, this transfer of our culture belongs. And, and make no mistake about it, for all of you in Australia, you have to be both Australian and African. And you have, each of you, at the level of the individual, at the level of the family, at the level of your groups, your society, work out what that means to you. Let me add a few more things to the list that must, must really be done. There is an absolute need to see a different level of representation on the television in Parliament among decision makers about who African Australians are. And if you can find the capacity to influence how people of African descent get into these public spaces, is there a judge, a magistrate, do you have law enforcement officers, university professors, people on television, in front of the camera, behind the camera, people in sports, people in business, individual businesses, owning their own businesses, people in high office and low office. If you are able to do that through your advocacy, then what you give out comes back to you and over time, you see that growth and development. So I close with the observation that where you are today is a really, really good step. You are at a pivotal moment that if you were to make a breakthrough in some things, and I want to put two things forward, economic independence, economic viability, financial viability, that's one bundle. And the second bundle is our education technical education, academic education, vocational education, higher education, completing school, learning. When we look at those two pillars, we have seen around the world in all kinds of society, that groups that are able to educate themselves and are able to achieve economic or financial viability and independence are able to survive, they're able to grow, they're able to thrive. So that's what I offer you. That's, that's my contribution to your agenda. Of course, I'll listen in to your meeting and please feel always welcome to call on me for help, but also to share because you will make progress and we will also call on you to see and learn about what you're doing. Thank you very much for the opportunity for sharing with you today. And I hope you have a really, really good meeting. Thank you.